2015, the year of artificial intelligence, from robots that may be able to grow and birth babies to advances in medicine with artificial intelligence at the forefront. Tech companies are throwing their weight and resources behind AI. Taking risks can be a reward, but it also has the potential for the abuse of power. We'll discuss China's advancements in innovation a little later in the show, but we'll start our discussion about the advancements in artificial intelligence. Joining me now from Montreal is Nick Bostrom, founding director of the Future of Humanity Institute and a philosophy professor at Oxford University. And from Houston, Texas, Leroy Chow is an engineer and former NASA astronaut. Both of you, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Nick, I want to start with you because you really have been at the forefront of, in, uh, of artificial intelligence uh, before it became a household name. Where are we? in terms of the application of AI in 2015, and what's been the history, and what are the future developments? Big question. <laughs> um, well, AI has uh, historically gone through various cycles of alternating great excitement, enthusiasm, and hope, followed by periods of disillusionment, AI winters. I think right now we are in an AI spring. Uh, at the moment, there is a sense of things moving forward again, particularly with advances in machine learning. Um, this is creating algorithms um, that have the ability uh, to learn from experience, to build complex representations and do a wide range of tasks. Uh, Leroy, I want to bring you in here. As a former uh, NASA astronaut, you've always been on the sharp edge of innovation. Where can you see AI making a difference in 2016 and going forward? Right, so as, as was pointed out, uh, you know, heuristic machines, AI is not a new thing, but it's certainly evolving seemingly at a much faster pace these days. Uh, computers are wonderful tools, and uh, you know, a, a, an AI computer or device or machine could help us greatly in many endeavors, including space exploration. I think the key is figuring out how to use it effectively, and as you pointed out, how to keep it from becoming a, a possible problem. We'll get onto the problems in a minute. Nick, I, I want to talk to you about the applications that are coming forward. You mentioned that we're in this AI spring. A lot of it has to do with processing speed, the cloud, huge amounts of uh, data processing. So what can artificial intelligence do for us now, and what's it going to do in the next 10 years? How's it going to affect life for me and, and, and everyone watching? Well, so techniques that have come out of AI labs are in use in a wide range of different sectors in the economy. We just don't always think of it as artificial intelligence. But every time you use your credit card, there is software running in the background that is scanning for patterns of fraud in uh -huh. credit card transactions and blocks your account if it sees something suspicious. Uh, uh, big companies have a logistics management system that uses techniques from AI. And so in many, many places, of course, Google search engine is maybe the premier example of, of a big successful AI program that is helping you find relevant information. Um, what we've seen in the last few years are great advances um, in perceptual understanding. So we now have artificial intelligence that is pretty good at, say, recognizing handwritten digits or recognizing faces, um, being able to uh, annotate uh, images that depict scenes. So great strides being made there. Uh, also in automated translation, we are seeing rapid progress. And, and, and this is primarily driven by advances, recent advances in deep learning, um, which does take advantage, as you suggested, of the increasing uh, processing power, but also of the large data sets that are available and some new uh, advances in the design of algorithms. Uh, this is so interesting, but of course, with this rapid development, Leroy, it becomes uh, also a trust issue. As a former astronaut, you know, you rely on humans. You can look them in the eye. Um, do you feel that if we're not uh, careful, that uh, AI could be making life and death decisions for humans going forward? Right, and I think you've just hit the nail on the head. The idea of having AI as an assistant, as a tool, is fantastic. You look at a spacecraft, all the different interacting systems on a spacecraft, a failure in one system in one area could deeply affect another one, and that's what part of what we do so much uh, training on, why we spend so much time in the simulators, 
are these situations where we have to learn, hey, if we normally do this failure occurs, but if we've also got this failure, then that could really cause a big problem. So the AI could assist in all of those things and recognize and learn all that much more quickly than we could. And then what the key would be for the AI device or the machine to tell us, hey, here's what I think you should do because based on A, B, and C, instead of doing it itself. You know, it'd be tempting just to hook it in and let it take all the action itself. But uh, I think you need that, that break, uh, that, that break point to let the humans make the decision on whether to proceed with action as opposed to letting the machine do it all. Uh, yeah, Nick, can you pick up on that? What are the sort of ethical implications of when human meets machine, or is it not as black and white as that? Well, I mean, certainly in certain applications, it makes sense for the machine to suggest and then the human to decide. But often you need uh, online real-time performance. If you have a self-driving car, for example, you know, it's not good for the AI to sort of recommend maybe move the wheel to the left. Like you want <laughs> the AI actually to be able to do a lot of the steering. Um, so I, I think that as we move forward and develop more complex systems, more adaptive systems, systems that can actually learn and improve their performance over time, there will be an increasing range of applications, but also the, the safety uh, and, and, and security and control issues will become increasingly important uh, as we move towards the general intelligence that ultimately is what makes us humans uh, so powerful on this planet. Uh, Nick, I just want you to follow up. I, in my reading for this, I, I found it fascinating that, that AIs can be brought into a lot of management decisions potentially in the future, that it can make judgment calls much quicker, for example, where to deploy resources uh, uh, in a tragedy or a natural uh, disaster, things that uh, humans are used to doing in small groups. Do you think AI could, could get to a point where they do deploy uh, in emergency responses, for example, better than humans? Well, so my view is that in, in the longer term, uh, AIs will be able to do all the things that we do and indeed do them much better and do a lot of other things as well. But it's important to keep in mind the time scale here. It's a big distinction if we're talking about what machines can do now or will do in the next 10 years or so, than, than if we're having a conversation where, where this will ultimately lead if we keep pursuing this for many decades. Um, in the short term, I'm kind of skeptical that a lot of management decisions uh, will be outsourced to AI, although I think they can play an important role in, in bringing information uh, to the eyes of decision makers, to find patterns uh, in, in big data and, and kind of highlight possible relationships between different data. It's interesting because science obviously uh, wants to move forward, but there are some scientists who see problems with AI uh, going forward. Stephen Hawking, very famous uh, physicist, had this to say. The primitive forms of artificial intelligence we already have, have proved very useful. But I think the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Once humans develop artificial intelligence, it would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. Humans, who are limited by slow biological evolution, couldn't compete and would be superseded. Uh, Leroy Chow, that was Stephen Hawking. You could say someone who may have benefited from a huge advancement in, in voice technology, expressing his doubts through technology. Sure, and you know what he's saying, of course, is that as we develop faster machines, uh, and if we give them the, bil the ability to reproduce and, and evolve, they would evolve much more quickly because they would do everything faster. But it's interesting to note, I mean, the biggest neural network we've built cannot even come close to the number of connections we have in the human brain. It's just that the machines can operate, the, 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 uh, uh, the network can operate much more quickly, but not with as many nodes. And so it's an interesting debate, you know, and Stephen Hawking is not alone. Elon Musk has publicly said, you know, the founder of SpaceX and uh, Tesla has publicly uh -huh. said many times that, that uh, he feels the similar threat. And I can see their argument. And that's why I think uh, AI is a wonderful tool, but we've got to make sure that, you know, we kind of could keep it under control or limit what we allow it to do. Nick Bostrom, do you think there's enough skepticism in the field uh, with scientists? We heard warnings there from Stephen Hawking and, of course, uh, Elon Musk before. Well, I, th I think that the sense, it's correct sense, is that this will be going forward. Um, on the wide frontier, we will get increasingly powerful machine intelligences. 
Um, and maybe at some point they will go all the way to have the same general intelligence that humans have. And at that point, then this control problem arises. Uh, how to engineer human level and indeed super intelligent machines such that they are aligned with human values, that they are safe and beneficial. And, and that will require the solution to a range of technical problems. And, and one of the encouraging things that has started to happen I mean, pretty much this past year, the last couple of years, is that there is now the beginnings of a small research community that is focusing on these control problems and trying to begin to work on those so that we will have a solution in time for when it will be needed. Nick, I just want to follow up on that. You said human values, but human values aren't necessarily always good, are they? <laughs> we have dark sides as well. There's also huge amounts of uh, applications for artificial uh, intelligence, for example, on a military level. How, how, do we, how do we build those concerns into the development? Well, there are many challenges that, that will need to be confronted. Um, there is a technical challenge. If you have any human value, any goal, how do you actually get that into a machine? That's a big technical question that we need to solve in order then to have a shot at this second problem, mm. which is deciding which value we want to give it. But, but you need a solution to the technical problem in order even to be able, be able to confront this political or ethical problem. But ultimately, both of those are, of course, extremely important. Um, I don't think with regard to the political and ethical problem that there is a sort of silver bullet or a simple answer. That, that's just something that um, societies will have to work through, through discussion and compromise and, and gradually developing some kind of understanding of what seems reasonable. The same arguments we're having over DNA and, uh, and everything like that as technology increases. Uh, Leroy, I just want to bring you in here. Let's flip it around a bit. What does the average global consumer want from AI? Where do you think AI can actually help us live our daily lives without being fearful of it? Right, and, and I think uh, you know, we're discussing an interesting point. How, do you, how would you impress empathy uh, onto a machine? You know, and, and as was just pointed out, um, that's not something you can necessarily, the technology doesn't exist now to do that. And so if you create something that can mimic the human brain and you know, how, can you also create this, these emotions or, or empathetic responses and things like that? And so I think if you, you, know, if you, if you, if you evolve the AI to be an advisory, kind of a thing, and it's different if it's part of an autopilot and you're actually flying a spacecraft or an, an automobile, driving an automobile, of course that's different than troubleshooting a, a problem in the system. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of being very careful to evolve this uh, in a controlled manner, you know, that we don't just kind of, uh, you know, we have to think it through. Okay, uh, Nick, uh, where do you think uh, AI could work I in the home? Are we going to have robot companions like in the movie, artificial intelligence, which caused a bit of stir? And, and will they be able to empathize with us? That sort of idea of, you know, do robots dream of electric sheep? Uh, that was a, a, a very famous uh, title of a novel. Well, empathy to me uh, is a problematic word because it means two different things. On the one hand, it means the ability to understand what somebody else is thinking and feeling. Um, and in that sense, I'm sure that machines will increasingly be able to do that. But on the other hand, it also means caring about what somebody else wants, caring about somebody else's suffering. And, and these two things don't necessarily come together. You could have the ability to understand what somebody else is feeling without being moved by it. Mm. As we see, say, in human psychopaths who might be very good at reading minds, they just don't uh, care and they just use it to manipulate people. Yeah. So what we really want is machines that, that care about our values, that care about what we feel um, and, and that are motivated by that. C can we do that? Um, well, I think to be able to do that in the full context for, for an AI that had the same general intelligence that we do and operates in the wide world, we don't yet know how you would do that. Um, but hopefully by the time we figure out how to make machines that smart, we will have figured out how to also make machines who are that smart, safe and human friendly. Uh, last word to Leroy Chow. Uh, do you think in all of this we're kind of engineering our own uh, end of uh, humankind as we know it? 
Well, I think that's certainly a possibility, and people like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk are, are concerned about it. And I can see the path on how you know that could happen. And so it's it's just like any other tool. You know, you it either you can either use it for good or it can <laughs> be used against you. And so uh, we just have to be careful how we evolve policy and regulation and all those things that uh, uh, you know control every every other tool that we use. Well, uh, Leroy Chow, no artificial intelligence uh, from you. It's the real thing. Same from you, uh, Nick Bostrom, as well. We thank you so much for joining us. Coming up, is Silicon Valley a myth? We talked to one venture capitalist about innovation beyond the US. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.